In this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we have a very special guest from NVIDIA joining us to talk all things GeForce RTX 3090, 3080, and Ampere next. Welcome back to yet another fine episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks webcast. With me, as always, is my compatriot, Marco Ciappetta. How you doing today, buddy? I'm doing much better today now that this 3090 piece is behind me. That's yeah, for sure. That's it. It's a little bit of work. We, uh, we burned some midnight oil with you. But today, we get to have a little fun with our buddy, Tony Tomasi from NVIDIA Tony. Um, I also might add, Tony seems to be a, a nice Italian fellow. <laughs> Tony, right. how how you doing? <laughs> I'm all right. How you doing? How you doing? See? Yeah, we're yeah, all family, doing, uh, doing from Campobasso, Italy. That's really? uh, my grandfather. My grandfather's from Campobasso, Italy. That's that's awesome. So so grandfather. So you're a second generation then, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I, the only Italian I know is words I can't use. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I got a few. I got a few like manja, you know, I can pull that one out. Oh, right? yeah, sure. <laughs> Paisan, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, the fun ones I can't say. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Well, it's it's great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us today. You guys have been keeping us busy this month. We've been uh, we've been you know writing things up and benchmarking and taking pictures and all kinds of stuff. And uh, we thank you for keeping that. us busy with the with the technology. It's good stuff. Um, we appreciate it. Yeah, and and we should start with a little bit about about you. Let's let's talk about your your name, rank, and serial number, so to speak. You are <laughs> VP of technical marketing. So you're like. Head of the smart guys, right? Ah, no, the, the smart guys would be the engineers and architects. I guess I try to maybe translate engineers and architects into, you know, words and understanding that normal humans can kind of comprehend and parse. So yeah. I kind of view my job as the the conduit between the real smart guys uh, and then everyone else who doesn't who didn't grow up, you know, writing RTL and live in C plus plus and you know forgot what Z buffers meant. So that's my job. There you go. There you go. Keeping it digestible for the rest of us. And we appreciate that um, because it's pretty complex stuff when you're talking about big honking GPUs like the RTX 3090. Um, but good stuff. And uh, how long have you been at NVIDIA? I mean, uh, you've been in the industry quite a while. We won't date you, but <laughs> <laughs> at least as long as we've been around. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess I've been doing pretty much graphics kind of stuff since college. Um, uh, go, you know, in the, the 3d GPU space, I, I go back to the 3d FX era and I've been in NVIDIA for, um, I think about 22 years or so doing a whole bunch of things. I, uh, did product management. I was a general manager. Uh, I ran our kind of developer organization for a while. That was the content and tech group. And now I run the technical marketing group. So I've, I've got to wear a lot of different hats, which is great. Um, and NVIDIA is a great place to work because there's you know, something new always around the corner, always technology to learn and, you know, new things to do, which, which keeps it interesting. Nice. You didn't, you didn't get a, uh, you didn't cultivate a, a nice, uh, spatula collection over the years. <laughs> there, no, I, you know, my wife says I've cultivated a far too large of a t-shirt collection, but spatulas uh, aren't my thing. The closest <laughs> thing I have in my office would be maybe swords. I have a, you know, some fun swords I can collect, but no spatulas. Nice. Nice. <laughs> well, we'll, um, We'll, we'll, we'll talk about more things about you as we go along here, but we do want to pepper you with a few questions. And certainly, uh, the audience, we welcome you to, to chime in with uh, your burning questions as well for, for Tony. Uh, but Marco, um, I know you want to dig in early, and uh, you probably got a few things on top of mind. I've got a few things. Why don't we uh, we'll go easy with, with Tony at first and then kind of you know ramp up to a full sprint, I guess, maybe, huh? Yeah, let you know. Just, I just want to address the address the chat quickly. We're gonna have lots of questions flying in. Um, yeah, I'm just want to say if you're rude in the chat, we're gonna ignore you. Um, <laughs> you know, seriously, Tony's nice enough to be on here, come live and answer questions directly from the community. Um, if you're a troll, we're, we're just gonna ignore it. I'm sorry, um, but yeah. So getting back to the topic at hand, um, <laughs> it seems to me, you know. With this generation, um, having just come off the 3080 review and now finishing the 3090 review this morning, what, what struck me is sort of the, the big leap that you guys made in terms of performance. You basically, you know, your, your new $700 card um, just 
basically wiped the floor with everything. And now your new beast, you know, just one ups that particular card. It seems like you guys made some big bets and big changes with the Ampere architecture. Um, can you tell us sort of how the thought process works there after, you know, Turing launches, you see how ray tracing behaves, how that chip performs, and now it's time to build Ampere. Can you give us some background on how that process works? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, Turing was a big bet, right? Because tackling real-time ray tracing was um, something the industry and us, the folks in graphics have dreamed of for, for decades, uh, but it's always been kind of just out of reach. So we made a pretty big bet with Turing to, to chase after it, to chase after real-time ray tracing. Um, and we delivered you know, a pretty revolutionary product in that it kind of you know, maybe reset or set the industry going on a, you know, a new path that's down the ray tracing path. But I think a lot of people were um, not satisfied with what it delivered and that what they wanted was not just, you know, incredible new visuals with ray tracing, but they wanted performance to be faster with ray tracing on than the previous generation. And that was a tall order. And honestly, we, we didn't quite get there with Turing, right? You could turn ray tracing on and often get performance kind of similar to what Pascal delivered with ray tracing off. But what people wanted was, you know, something better than that. So we, um, the other advantage we had is that we could take, you know, a couple years worth of games, and analyze how they've been using the ray tracing hardware and what they've been doing, um, and then make modifications to the architecture to make those things go faster. And so uh, we basically doubled down on RT core horsepower. There's, you know, twice the ray triangle intersection horsepower. We doubled down on floating point shader throughput, which is particularly important for complex shaders and in particular denoisers, also important for ray tracing. And then we doubled down on tensor core, which is for things like DLSS. Um, those or there's a lot of transistors spent on those things. Those don't generally benefit what I'd call um, traditional kinds of games quite as much. Although even traditional games saw a nice benefit, as you saw with Ampere. Uh, but the the goal here was to be able to deliver that kind of true, you know, next generation leap in performance for all classes of games, ray tracing and not ray tracing games. Uh, and to do that, we had to go to a new process. We went to Samsung 8N. Um, we went to a new generation of memory with G6X to get more memory bandwidth. Um, and the combination of all that allowed us to deliver a, a product which is, you know, not quite, but, you know, roughly speaking, twice the performance, generation to generation. Um, and, you know, that's, I think, what I think users were hoping for. And so far, the response has been, you know, fantastic. You know, obviously, I wish we could uh, build more faster. It's not that we're not building as fast as we can. And I know a lot of people, you know, are, were uh, disappointed that, you know, the supply sold out so fast, but we're, we're making them as fast as we can. And we're trying to make sure that they're getting in the hands of gamers. Yeah. 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 So lo local to me, my, the micro center in my area had a line of like 200 people before they opened. I've never seen that for like a GPU launch. I've seen it for iPhones and, and you know, silly stuff like that, but this was pretty <laughs> nuts. There, there seems to be a, a lot of pent up demand for this launch. Um, and just the price performance ratio of, of 3080 versus everything else was just, it was one of those articles where I was finished looking at the numbers. I'm like, like literally across the board, just, just annihilated everything. But you, you kind of mentioned a few things that is a good segue to another question. You guys made a lot of bets with this generation, like G new, new memory, new PCB designs, a really radically redesigned cooling, a new, you know, custom Samsung manufacturing process. That seems like a lot of bets to make on one generation. What was it about this time around that said, you know what, let's just go all in with everything? <laughs> yeah, I mean, NVIDIA is um, pretty aggressive in general, technology-wise. You know, no, have, not yeah. NVIDIA. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so in some ways you could say we went all in, but we kind of, we, we placed a big bet with Turing, and you could say we doubled down with Ampere, right? We took everything that we did in Turing, and then we just turned it all up to 11. Um, we've always tended to be on the, the leading edge for memory technology and everything else, but some of the, the bets that we placed on Turing... Um, they paid off um, and we wanted to, you know, just ratchet it up again. And we had the advantage of having, you know, two years of working with game developers and their content to understand their workloads and what we could do to, you know, you know, improve the architecture to deliver performance that wasn't kind of, we didn't have to reinvent everything, um, but we did have to invent, you know, quite a bit of new stuff. As you said, we, we designed a new thermal solution so that the whole system stays cool and quiet despite the power going up a little bit. Um, we, you know, designed a new PCB so we could design a new thermal system. So there's, you know, lots of changes there. Those are not, you know, like rocket science things like, you know, going to the moon, but all those subtle refinements all brought together to, to produce a, you know, a pretty revolutionary product. And as you mentioned, 
the the price perf of 3080 compared to the previous generation, it's it's as good or as or maybe better than any generational leap that we've ever made. Yeah, good stuff. And and that was actually a, a thought that I had as well. Big silicon bets obviously made, and then you know a serious engineering effort on the cooling solution. Was that a function of the additional power requirements of uh, of Ampere and 3080 and 3090? Um, or was it more like, hey, we just want to engineer the best cooling solution we can we can deliver for for a product? A, a little bit of both. You know, we always want to deliver the best you know cooling solution that we can. Um, we also wanted to deliver the best product that we could. And we know we kind of you know got a feedback that they wanted something that was kind of revolutionary in performance. Our customers really wanted us to deliver on that promise that they that they were hoping for. And to do that, we had to push power up a little bit. Um, but we wanted to do that in a way that actually brought acoustics down and brought thermals down. And so if you look at 3080, it consumes more power than a 2080, but it runs cooler and it runs quieter. And to do that required a kind of a rethink on the, the thermal design. Um, it did require a little, you know, a little more volume. It's a, a bigger product from a, just a XYZ perspective and it weighs a little bit more, uh, but the results are good. You know, it's a, a good piece of engineering to be able to get that much heat, you know, and that much power out of a system and, and stay that quiet. I, I would agree. It is a it is a great looking card, and it performs thermally really well. Marco, you're you're picking it up there. I was just going to say for everybody <laughs> that's live watching that hasn't seen side by side the difference between a 3080 and the 3090. So here's the 3080. I'm going to hold it up here. This is the the founders edition 3080. Hopefully, I'm in focus. I have to block my eyes, or the camera's going to focus on my good. eyes. Looks good. So that's the 3080. You know, two two slots. Your common enthusiast kind of form factor here, and. Let me see if I can do it with one handed. I'm getting old. I'm getting <laughs> yeah, old. Yeah, 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 yeah. There, there <laughs> is the 3090, right? The 3090, very similar design language, right? So from a distance, they, they look similar, but just bigger and burlier all around with the 3090 here. It's the, the same physical GPU underneath, but you know, everything is amped up in, in the in the big boy here. So this is the card that launched today. Everyone, you see, this is three slots, three slots wide. She's just tall bigger, too. Bigger fans, yeah. Just she, she's a big girl. She's big, <laughs> but she, she delivers. So fastest GPU ever tested all around. Whether it's compute, rasterization, ray tracing, every single test across the board. Um, where your GPU limited, thirty ninety beat everything else significantly. Um, the fastest card in in the you know, competitions tank right now is about 3x slower in some tests. Um, so just a, a beast all around, you know, kudos to NVIDIA for coming out with something like that. What a beast. <laughs> well, we'll have to get back to 3090 performance, but I did, there is an interesting question in the chat that maybe, Tony, you can field. Um, the difference between custom Samsung 8N uh, manufacturing process, which I believe was, you know, code, code, a co-development effort, I think, um, and then, you know, versus TSMC, and we all know nanometers are not all created equal and all that good stuff. But what, what are your thoughts on that question? Because I thought that was an interesting one. Yeah, I mean, honestly, they're both good processes, and we use them both. As you know, A100, um, the, the first member of the Ampere family targeted toward data center, uses TSMC7. Um, and the, the kind of GeForce line of the Ampere products use Samsung. They're, they're both good processes. Um, and we've worked hard to tune both of them to be good processes for NVIDIA GPUs. You know, we have to tune transistors and leakage and frequencies and performance to kind of suit our needs. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I don't have bad things to say about either. Um, they're, they're both great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just different, uh, different fab partners, which makes sense. I mean, you have, you know, that it makes sense to, you know, hedge your bets uh, with multiple suppliers, um, you know, on different product lines. Uh, that's a good, that makes good business sense. Uh, that's the first thing I thought of as well. Um, cool. What else do we got, Marco? And I know we've got a few of our own questions. I don't know if you saw something else in the chat, though. So lots of the chat is, is uh, revolving around um, availability and stuff like that. We'll sa we'll save that for the end. Um, that's you know, and asking about lower end models. I'm gonna you know what? Let me answer some of the questions that I know Tony can't answer because of embargoes <laughs> and you know. So uh, there, there's a, a couple of questions um, asking about: Is there a roadmap for lower end designs? You know, below 3070. Um, obviously, yes. Nvidia's mo is typically to come out with a new architecture and then scale it up and down the stack. So no official announcement announcements, but it's a safe bet that there will be something lower end coming. Um, <laughs> that is, I'm, I'm just going to say that for Tony because he can't say that, you know, he's not going to disclose <laughs> anything that the company hasn't already disclosed. You know, that's just how that works. Um, 
But going back to the 3090 and before we get to performance and some of the other features, um, one of the things as a hardcore enthusiast, and you, you mentioned that you're from 3D effects, and this goes all the way back to the 3D effects days when we were running yeah, SLI man. with Voodoo 2s. Um, it the, the with this latest generation, and I and I, I need to preface that this isn't necessarily you know Nvidia is doing the the gaming deve game developers and the gaming market kind of has moved this way over the last few years with the newer APIs. But it seems that SLI and multi GPU is sort of less of a focus, and now. Um, NVIDIA is not even going to be developing SLI profiles. It's sort of falling on game developers now to incorporate SLI into their games. And with the 3090, it's the only card that has, you know, the edge connectors to link multiple cards. Can you give some insight into how that all played out? Yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned, SLI has always been um, an enthusiast thing. Uh, and going back to, in fact, before Voodoo 2, there was actually SLI in Voodoo 1 for arcade machines and stuff like that using, going back. And, and that was... Um, for the, the fringe of the fringe, so to speak. So it's always been an enthusiast or kind of an extreme niche um, segment. Uh, and a couple things have happened. Graphics cards have gone from, you know, well, way back in the day, there might have been 99 to 199 to now a high-end graphics card is over $1,000. So we've kind of pushed that, that enthusiast, you know, edge out quite a ways from where it used to be. Um, the second thing is that the, the applications themselves are now built largely around DX12, and you can't really do kind of SLI behind the applications back. It's, there's kind of two modes for SLI. One's implicit, which means the driver basically handles it for it, and the other's explicit, which means the application developer handles it using the API. And DX12, you can really only do explicit, meaning that the app developer has to do that work. And what we found is that most of the interesting games are heading towards DX12s, and most of the games that scaled well uh, were DX12. So there's nothing we could really kind of auto magically do for them other than just kind of continue to lean in and support game developers that wanted to implement, you know, SLI in their game engines. And we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to support all those developers that want to do SLI in engine. Um, and then lastly, we put the connector on the, the enthusiast or the extreme product because that's the one that makes the most sense. I guess along with a little bit of that is that, you know, graphics have been getting faster at a faster rate than this, the CPU platforms have. Um, and, and you've probably saw that some of your testing. You take a 3090 and you run it at 1080, you know, it's it doesn't really seem like it's that much faster than the 3080 at 1080 because you're starting to be CPU limited. So you really need a platform that can also kind of push push that. What that also pushes you towards the higher end. You want the fastest possible CPU, you know, and hopefully at some point we'll get uh, Gen 4 across the board so that all platforms can benefit from Gen 4. Um, but it's kind of already an extreme thing. So we felt we just kind of, you know, lean in that. We're still supporting SLI. You know, we we have SLI connectors on the high end. We're going to continue to support that. We're still supporting all the developer partners that want to do SLI through explicit mode. Uh, but, it, you know, it just felt like, you know, implicit was um, increasingly hard to do um, because the, the apps just weren't really there to do it. Um, and the, the niche has kind of gotten um, even more nichier, so to speak. <laughs> the high end's gotten just higher and higher. Yeah, it, it's funny looking to just looking through the testing. Um, that's something a conversation Dave and I had this morning. Like yeah. one thing that this launch has taught me is we need faster CPUs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you literally at, at the thirty ninety, it's at below four K. You know, it's essentially CPU bound, right? So yeah, you can test it and you can get some benchmark scores, but if you're not one hundred percent GPU bound, the CPU is what's you know pumping those frames. So it's 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 crazy how much horsepower just this one generation that we've uh, that you guys have added. It's pretty it's pretty wild. Or everyone needs to start doing path tracers, or, know, or like that my, my, Minecraft or Q two RTX, right? Every, if everyone did a path tracer, we wouldn't be CPU limited at all. So you you, that's a perfect segue to one of uh, one of our other questions. Okay, so, far away. <laughs> you know, with, with this new generation, because performance is so much higher. You know, with with Turing with the, with the first gen RTX cards, um, I don't think it's unfair to say adoption of you know RTX technology in games wasn't quite what Nvidia wanted. Um, with this generation of cards, with performance being so much higher, what's the feedback from game developers now? Do you guys suspect quicker, ado more adoption of RTX-based titles, ray tracing-enabled titles, and you know, especially with the consoles now supporting ray tracing or probably different yeah. form of ray tracing? Wait, but what's, you, what's your you take actually, on it? Yeah, you nailed it. There's there's a couple factors there. The first is that um, ray tracing initially, when we first launched it, was was new. And a lot of people had to do a lot of learning for how to work ray tracing into their engine. And we always expected it to be a hybrid approach where you'd use combinations of ray tracing and rasterization. So that wasn't really a surprise. The um, 
all of us, the industry, have what two or three decades worth of lore and knowledge and experience in optimizing rasterized types engines and pipelines. And we're just now on that starting point for ray tracing. So it, we, we kind of knew there was going to be a ramp there, um, but the ramp has been pretty fast, right? Uh, developers have learned a lot about ray tracing and we're at that kind of nice steep part of the curve where, you know, each each quarter, it seems like someone learns a new trick and we we find a way to you know, extract almost another factor of two just out of software, you know, tricks and optimizations. Um, so developers, the kind of the ones that were technically forward, they, they went in on ray tracing um, and they kind of started learning first. And now we're on our, I would even characterize our third generation of ray tracing games. Um, and partly what's kind of helped is that the algorithms have gotten better, the denoisers have gotten better, the, the, the ways to do shadowing and aim and occlusion and reflections have gotten better. Um, the other thing, the hardware, of course, has gotten faster, but that's, I would say that's not the primary factor, really. I think it's just everyone's understanding algorithmically of how to build good ray tracing hybrid engines. Um, and, you know, obviously the consoles having ray tracing has meant that, you know, it, we knew it was inevitable. We just had to wait for everyone to to say so, right? And so Sony and Microsoft have both said they're going to support ray tracing, and and you know we assume everyone will eventually support ray tracing and hardware. Um, and I think the developers have heard that, and so now it's kind of it's not. I think we always knew that it wasn't a question of if, only a question of when. I think now everyone has recognize that it's not an if it's just really a when and so everyone's diving in and you even got you know some of the most mainstream games like minecraft or world of warcraft supporting ray tracing now so it's it's about as mainstream as it gets yeah and actually i had a question on on the tensor core side of things and i know you uh -huh. folks have um tweaked and amped up things in ampere for for tensor uh core resources um what is the what does the future of that look like for you for you as well or in your vision I guess and now we have DLSS 2.0 now and and that's looking pretty sharp but but where are we you know are we going to see more of that kind of stuff in game engines or other types of features that uh, can be enhanced by AI um, you know or machine learning of some sort uh, for sure I mean we've um... Uh, we started with DLSS one, and, and again, algorithmically, we continue to to innovate on it. And I think, by, you know, by the time we got to DLSS two, I think people realized that that wasn't again. That's a probably not a, an if thing, but it's here to stay. People, I think, find it pretty compelling now. The the quality performance trade off is really good, particularly because I think in a lot of cases there's almost no quality trade off. It's just really free performance there to be had. Um, we've been innovating in other spaces outside of gaming, you know, things like RTX voice and broadcast, so people can do noise reduction and uh, green screen and things of that nature. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity in the gaming space for using AI on the content creation side. Developers have been using it for a while. Um, they've been using it for the uh, for cheat detection to try to make gameplay fair. Uh, folks like Valve have given presentations on how they're using AI to, to detect you know, people who aren't playing fairly and, and take action based on it. Um, and I think you're gonna see, you know, ultimately over time, AI being used, I'll call it at runtime, you know, for things like maybe speech synthesis or speech recognition in games, or maybe um, you'll have um, uh, NPC behavior in games or you know, the mobs, um, instead of being pre-scripted, uh, with just kind of cleverly written, you know, human written things, they will actually learn from the players. So imagine in World of Warcraft, a boss fight, you know, the way it works now is, you know, the programmers at Blizzard code up the way the, the boss behaves, you know, in a predefined fashion. And then once the players learn how to beat it, it becomes a dance, you know, stand here, go there, don't do this, do that. It's just you're playing back that dance. But imagine if the the boss learned from the players and learned <laughs> how the players were fighting it and actually responded. That would make beating the boss, you know, different every time and much harder. And I can imagine at some point games will start to, to take on a, you know, a continuously learning aspect. Um, and that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, you can imagine that, you know, games becoming kind of infinitely more replayable if they weren't, you know, just being stepped through like a dance move. I never, I never thought of that scenario. I don't know why, but that's, that's excellent. That's a, I, yeah, I think that's a great use of the technology and uh, that's pretty cool to, to, to think about. Wow. It's a little, I mean, you know, that can go, um, a lot of different ways, right? Because you you have if you have ten million players playing a game and you have the AI learning from ten million players, then oh maybe, yeah, <laughs> then, then maybe it learns to beat all ten million players, and that might be so. You'd have to do some tuning with that too. It's not just going to happen automatically. But developers have also been using AI to to replace 
or, or, or supplement QA testing. You know, so the repetitive nature of testing in games where you have to go through and do you fall through the crack in the world? Do you get stuck in this piece of geometry? That kind of stuff where you have to, you know, have a person kind of laboriously go through the whole world. You can train AI to do some of that kind of laborious kinds of testing. Same thing on the content creation side. Instead of paying an artist to place every little shrub and tree, you have them kind of paint a sample biome and use a neural network to populate, you know, a large open world, things like that. So there's all sorts of interesting uses for AI, a lot of which have already been, you know, used in games kind of behind the scenes, but I think it's going to be increasingly more common, you know, at runtime. Yeah, that makes good sense. Cool, good stuff. What else do we have, Mark? I know I've, we've got one in the chat uh, on, on the hardware side of things we can tackle from, uh, from Blackhawk, but uh, what else did you have? Yeah, so a couple of quick things. So uh, a Julian from the chat sent me a picture of a 3080, uh, 3070, sorry, from NVIDIA site asking about the cooler. Um, Julian, that's actually that picture is not Photoshopped incorrectly. It That's how the 3070 is going to be set up. The two fans are on the, the front side of the card, the traditional front side of the card, but the rear one does blow all the way through. So that's why you see the, the flat plate next to the, uh, the PCI Express connector, but the open heat sink at the back end. Um, nothing funky about that picture that you sent. I hope that clears that up. And now just, uh, Tony, some just, we're kind of going to shift gears here, but I'm going to try to burn through a couple of the questions that I see in the chat that didn't scroll by too fast. Yeah. The um, the new 12-pin connector that's on the NVIDIA Founders Edition cards. Um, one, can you explain why that came to be? And also, is it going to be a standard or is this something that board partners can use and chose not to? Um, what, what's that play with that connector? Yeah, so a couple of things. The connector itself is much more efficient from a current handling capability than the current 8-pin connectors. It means you can get more current in a smaller space, uh, quite a bit more current in a smaller space. And as you can see on the, the 3080 and 3090 designs, we have a, an unusual shaped PCB, right? It's kind of got that notch cutout to allow the flow through. Um, and we wanted to minimize the you know, aesthetic impact of those large blocky 8-pin connectors. And they also needed to fit you know, in a more convenient fashion. Um, so we designed that 12 pin to both be kind of industrial design more friendly as well as, you know, current wise more capable. Um, it's available to the, the whole industry already. Um, there's nothing proprietary about it. It's already kind of quote standardized. There's a spec for the connector. Um, we enabled the uh, Adding car guys to use it if they choose. We've enabled power supply vendors to, buy, to you know provide uh, direct connections to it if they like. Um, I think what you're going to see is a mix of that from adding card vendors. They may continue to use multiple eight pins. Some may use the 12 pin. Um, I think we went out with the 12 pin to kind of like we often do, just kind of get things moving, right? I, I think it's it makes sense in some cases for folks to continue to use with the eight pins because a lot of the power supply and cabling infrastructure is already around that, and you don't have to use the little dongle adapter. But I think over time you'll see more and more power supply ship with a direct 12 pin connector as opposed to having to use the dongle, which obviously makes for you know cleaner builds inside your PCs. Um, and you know over time that allows a lot more flexibility and just adding card design where you place them, how much space is taken up, that kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah makes sense. sense. Cool, what else we got? I know we've got a couple more on, on our blotter as well. <laughs> yeah, so just um, there's another question in the chat that I, I don't think, um, well, I'm gonna ask because, so the the, the data center focused Ampere release, there are GPUs with HBM2 support, correct? Or am I forgetting that? Am I getting yep. that? Okay. Yep. Is there, are there any plans? Is there even HBM support in like the GA102 and the high end cards? Um, can you give us some insight on why choosing, you know, GDDR6X and not some of the more exotic? I mean, GDDR6X is an exotic memory type, but going with something extreme bandwidth like, like HBM? Yeah, we, we always try to balance. The, the memory system with the, the product itself in the, in the core. Um, and there's also other things to balance too, capacity, cost, power, things of that nature. HBM2 is a great technology, but it's costly. It's really difficult to deliver HBM2 you know, into mainstream consumer space. So we worked really hard with the, the DRAM folks, you know, Micron and others to deliver G6X, which kind of delivers that next step up in terms of bandwidth without necessarily going to, I'll call it more exotic DRAM types like HBM. Um, but but those are great tools in the kind of the GPU toolbox, and we'll use the right memory for you know where it fits. Um, as to is there HBM2 support in uh, in 3080 or 3090? You know, I'll say is the current product support G6X. 
<laughs> there gotcha, you go. Gotcha. <laughs> well, I had a question. Go I was going to say for everybody watching, anything undisclosed, that's the kind of answer that you're going to get. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Otherwise, they won't let me talk anymore. I know. No, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble, around. Tony. Uh, we had another question that came in. Uh, we saw VR Link was was removed from this card. Uh, is there a future uh, to drive new I/O like VR Link or something like that? Um, or, I guess, what was the reasoning behind that? Uh, yeah, well, you know, we were we were early, I think, with that, you know, before we put it in previous gen products, um, you know, and uh, the, I would say the industry just didn't go there or didn't go there like we thought they did. We mm. they, they would. Um, and there's again, there's trade offs with that, too. You have to provision space, you have to provision power. Um, and we just felt that this generation, we, we took a bet. It, it didn't pay off kind of like we thought in the previous generation. Um, so the first generation, of these products don't include it. Um, you know, maybe at some point it will make more sense to include something like that. But it, like I said, there's trade-offs all in in that whole space, right? Do you give up bracket space? Do you provision power for it, and all those kinds of things? So, um, yeah. you know, th this this time it just made sense to to uh, you know go with DP and HDMI. Sure, sure, makes sense. What? Well, and I had a I had a sort of a general question on on the 30 series. Um, you know, I guess for you, in in terms of you know your role at Nvidia and, and what you're responsible for. What's the most exciting thing about this product launch and I guess what it enables for for gamers and game developers and, and next generation experiences? You seemed pretty passionate about the about, you know, future looking technologies with, with Tensor Core and machine learning. Um, I, 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 anything else that sort of comes to mind that's, I guess, you know, just a passion point for you on it? Yeah, I mean, well, as we talked earlier, I've been doing the graphics thing for a long time um, <laughs> and I've I've dreamt about real time ray tracing for for decades um so ampere for me is exciting on a whole bunch of fronts one is um you know i've been around for essentially every gpu launch in nvidia since you know before nvidia before i was nvidia it was tnt which wasn't we didn't call that yeah, a GPU i remember yet. that so yeah. yeah i've been around for every gpu launch and this has been you know as big a, a leap from a, a perf perspective generation maybe that we've ever had it's certainly as big a leap as we've had in recent memory and that's obviously super exciting because you know, that just means everything gets better without having to reinvent, you know, APIs and architectures. But I think kind of in it, just beyond the raw, you know, performance of the product, it does enable a new class of, of game. If you look at the, the demo that we put together with marbles, you know, that's a, a real time game. That's a real time path tracer, basically. Um, that's pretty exciting, right? That's a level of fidelity and rendering that used to be a cinematic. I mean, Quite literally, that used to be, you know, an offline rendered cinematic. You'd throw it, you know, run it on a, in a warehouse full of computers to render a frame an hour or a frame or something like that. And now we're delivering, you know, what used to be a cinematic in real time. I'm super excited, you know, for a generation of games that will, you know, maybe not now, but maybe sometime soon will be architected around, you know, ray tracing or path tracing first. Um, and that's not that far away. It's not inconceivable. Uh, you know, today games are architect around rasterization first because that's where the installed base is, and that's what the, the capability of most platforms are. But if you can kind of rethink the way you build your your engines and your applications to think about, you know, ray tracing first, you can you know really push the envelope, um, you know, visually, which is you know really exciting. So I, you know, that that kind of you know gets me going. The other thing I'd say is I think we we thought through the whole product. You know, everything about Ampere is um, had some thought put into it. The industrial design is fantastic. The cooling is great. The acoustics are good. All the software we put around it is great. We delivered things for, you know, people working at home, for streamers. We delivered things, you know, for p competitive games with esports with Reflex. You know, we've got forward-looking technology to solve for high-speed I.O. with RTX I.O. I mean, there's just, we wrapped a bunch of technology around this to deliver a really full-featured product. It's not just about you know, how many frames per second per dollar is it, but it's a complete, you know, product. And that's, that's really satisfying when you kind of covered all those bases. Sure. Sure. Good stuff. We had a question in the chat I thought was interesting. I'm not sure if uh, you can, you know, go there completely yet or not. And you can, you can uh, elect to, to not, I guess, but um, can you, can you ask him, can you ask Tony about how the acquisition of arm could affect the graphics game or could change the graphics game? Yeah. You know, I, I probably, probably shouldn't really go there um <laughs> you know, there's still a, a you know ways to go in terms of regulatory approval and stuff like that um but i you know it's, it's our mission nvidia hasn't really changed we want to build the best graphics processors and the best gp technology for every market that finds them valuable um that's 
always been what it is and always be what it will be, right? So, and that's evolved from it used to be, you know, graphics to professional graphics to, you know, to data center, and and we'll see where it goes with AI and beyond that. And that that kind of will always be our mission. So I don't think anything really changes in that sense. <clears throat> nice. Okay, Marco, what else we got? Um, so the chat is just flying by. It is. Um, <laughs> so something that uh, just I, I would love to get some more insight on and, and to understand how it's going to affect gamers. I mean, I, I kind of I kind of get it, but this is just something I wanted to drive home for the PC lovers because the console guys have been bragging about it for months. You mentioned RTX IO. Um, and how, so can you explain how RTX IO is going to sort of change the gaming experience and what that's going to enable for gamers that have one of these cards that's, that's capable of that technology? Yeah, so um, uh, RTX IO really solves or is meant to solve two problems in, in the PC gaming experience. Um, the first is it makes the IO operations themselves much more efficient. So there's some new low-level software and some parallelized APIs that we've worked on and we work with Microsoft on with direct stores that makes fundamentally reading, particularly reading from NVMe or SSDs, uh, much more efficient, meaning you can get a lot more IO operations per CPU. Which, so what that means is you can get a lot more out of your storage with a lot less CPU overhead. And that's something we actually already talked about, right? CPU limitedness. So we want to get the CPU out of the way as much as possible. Um, the second thing that RTX IO enables is GPU-based decompression. So game developers have started using, or they've been using uh, loss-less compression, not lossy, loss-less compression, uh, for quite some time, and that's to reduce the file size on the disk. And in particular for PCs that have, or, or game platforms that have relatively slow storage, say like a hard drive, lossless compression allows you to keep the, the data stored on the hard drive compressed. It's read off the hard drive and then historically decompressed by the CPU for use. And you get roughly a two to one, you know, amplifier of your bandwidth. So if you were getting 100 megabytes a second off of a hard drive, you now get 200 megabytes per second worth of IO, and your install size might have been half as, as big. When it's a hard drive and you have lots of CPU cores, that's maybe okay, but when you have a seven gigabyte per second SSD, there's just no practical way you know a reasonable CPU can keep up, right? You might keep 20 CPU cores fully saturated decompressing off of a seven gigabyte per second NVMe drive. So what we've done is we've implemented the, G the compression on the G GPU side along with those efficient APIs. So you can read in a super efficient manner from the SSD, get the data to the GPU in a compressed format, which means you're moving it around in the system in its most efficient manner, have the GPU decompress it, and you get all the benefits of that you know, compression, two to one amplification to bandwidth, two to one reduction in storage size without burdening the CPU. So what that'll mean is potentially much, much faster load times. Um, and in the streaming case, you could have large open worlds where you have less stuttering, more detail, that kind of stuff. And because it's offloading from the CPU, in, in CPU-bound circumstances, you could theoretically also get a frame rate boost, correct? Right. So developers will have to implement uh, direct storage or RTXO, so it yep. requires app-side integration. But for the developers that do, yeah, they would see a CPU offload or a reduction in CPU utilization, and in some cases, quite dramatically. So this seems like something competitive gamers, you know, esports guys would kind of love that. If that's incorporated into their games, you know, you know, and they want those super max frame rates, something that they're going to want to look into, correct? I think I think it can benefit all gamers, right? right. In fact, you know, um, a lot of the games that have the longest load times aren't even the competitive games, right? They can be open world RPGs where they're loading gigabytes and gigabytes of data just to start the game, and then you're navigating through these large open worlds and again moving, you know, potentially gigabytes uh, of data around as you shift between biomes and stuff like that. So personally, I think all gamers can benefit, and it can benefit current games because they can just generally load faster. And the way most games work today is they'll kind of what I call bulk load, they'll load for like the level or the world that you're in. And then when you go to the next level world, you'll be this, you know, pause where it does some loading or they'll have some kind of tricks. They'll, you know, basically trigger points where they start loading the next scenes. You know, Destiny, for example, when you go to between planets, that that time when you're flying in your spaceship, that's not just there to, you know, give you a pretty trip in your spaceship. They're doing loading. They're doing IO in those <laughs> cases. So exactly. you can cut those kinds of things down pretty dramatically. Yeah, and somebody actually had a, a question in the chat as well um, that sort of follows on to this. Do, does higher bandwidth, um, you know, does higher bandwidth storage, higher speed uh, NVMe SSDs, whether it be PCI Express 4 or, you know, even RAID configurations, it, does RTX IO, does it take advantage of that extra bandwidth? Um, you know, is the pipe fat enough, I guess, to utilize the higher end or, or is, you know, a standard SSD good enough? 
Yeah, so RTXIO is able to saturate way beyond a Gen 4 SSD in terms of bandwidth. So even if you have a by 4 Gen 4, you know, M2, you know, the latest generation, like the, the 980 Pro that Samsung just announced, right? Seven gigabytes a second sustained read. We, we can sync, meaning we can absorb a compressed stream far beyond that. In fact, if you look at the bus interface to a, an Ampere GPU is a by 16 uh, Gen 4, and we should be able to sync that, which would be, you know, multiple Gen 4 SSDs. Nice. So you could build you could build a big RAID array of Gen 4 SSD, and we could we could sync that, and we would we would amplify the bandwidth of all of that. Cool, cool. What else we got? And I know we've got a lot of questions on availability, and, and Tony, we're going to have to ask yeah. you to, to address that <laughs> one more time. But what else before we get to it? <laughs> yeah. So just some quick stuff. Um, yeah, we because we the, the natives are getting restless. So we have to talk about, about availability. But um, so we just had a quick question about about uh, I/O uh, display I/O. Someone's asking uh, any plans for DisplayPort two support and why it's not on these cards. If that's something you can answer. Oops, Oops. did we lose him? I think we lost audio on him. Uh oh. Nope, not hearing you right now. That's all right. That's all right. It'll come back. Chris, you got Tony on on audio, or is that? Uh... Did Skype bug? Is the question? Hey. <laughs> we'll get you back, Tony. Oh, is he some mics? He might. He might be. Stay tuned for for just a moment, folks. Tony is so. Let me see what I can answer from the chat. There was guys. I saw something about. Hold on. Let me go here. There we go. Sorry, hey, I lost. He's back. back. There he is. Woo. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no I'm not sure no what happened. No sorry. I so I missed that question, and I'm sure it was you know. Um, so, so someone, uh, no, it was quick. Someone was asking about DisplayPort 2 support. Um, anything you could say why it's not on these cards or, you know, is that something you can even comment yeah. on? Sure. I mean, it's a super simple answer. The spec wasn't ready by the time we were, you know, architecting the GPU. So it just didn't align in time. We always try to take the, the best, you know, technologies we can whenever we're building the GPU. But at some point you have to call it done because you got to like finish your verification. You got to tape it out. You got to bring it up and stuff like that. So the spec just wasn't done in time. Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, and so we, we have to, I think we have to address the elephant in the room because the chat is, is going nuts on availability. Blowing up, blowing up on um, availability. So That's a good problem to have, by the way. Yeah, exactly. So 3080. <laughs> we'd rather not have it, but yeah. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. So 3080 launched, no problem. disappeared immediately. I think you guys sort of, you know, in your blog post yesterday, quelled expectations on the 3090 and just explained this is going to be a limited launch. Can, can you explain how things played out in terms of availability and if there's anything you can tell uh, everyone? When viewing when they'll be able to buy a card or <laughs> yeah, <this. so, laughs> yeah I mean, first i just I, I would apologize for anyone who can't get a card that wants one i mean I, we wish that wasn't the case right um and i especially apologize for people who ran it you know i know at the launch of 3080 nvidia's site had problems we it went down and that was you know we shouldn't do that so we we took a lot of steps to try to improve things between 3080 and 3090 um it's you know it's still a problem where I think demand, almost regardless of what we did, was going to exceed our supply. Um, I think that's, um, we had a lot of supply. In fact, we had as much or more supply for this product that, that we've had a, of any product in recent memory. So it wasn't a case that we didn't build any, and it wasn't the case that our adding car guys, our adding car partners didn't have supply either. I just think that the demand was enormous. Um, and, you know, we, there's things that we, you know, can probably do going forward to maybe, um, you know, deal with the bots and the arbitrage a little bit better. Uh, we took some steps already uh, with the 3090. We put catchphrase in and stuff like that on our website. Uh, but it's a tough problem, and it's not a problem that's unique to NVIDIA. You look at Sony and Microsoft with PS5 and Xbox Series X, you know, they had similar problems. They did pre-orders, and they pretty much sold out within seconds, and then websites went down and stuff like that. Apple struggles with it. Um, I, I don't claim that world NVIDIA is world-class yet for, you know, e-tailing and, and, you know, selling from the site, uh, but we've heard... Um, the feedback, <laughs> you know, how could we not? And, and we're going to try to get better. Uh, you know, there's been lots of good ideas, you know, um, and I think that, um, and like I said, we are building them as fast as we can. Yields are good. Adding car 
partners are building inventory as to when you can get them. I, you know, I wish I could tell you, right? I, I you know, there's, things are going out as as fast as we can, and hopefully, you know, uh, supply will catch up the, with demand, or you know, soon. Yeah, if it's not nailed down, ship it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the, the, everyone in Nvidia realizes, you know, that there's huge demand, and you know, we expected you know, high demand. And we've been, like I said, we've been building like crazy and hopefully uh, we'll, supply will catch up soon. Cool. So did, did I hear you just mention that for, for this launch, you, you had as much stock of 3080 as you've had for previous gens, like for 2080. So it's just, it was demand that just swamped everybody and they just flew off shelves. It wasn't that there was lack of supply. Well, yeah. obviously there's lack of supply to well, meet the demand. Re relatively but, speaking, yeah, right. there was lack of supply to the demand, but there was, there was, I think, more supply of Ampere than there was of Turing. Wow. At launch. Wow. Okay. But, Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how you, uh, you know, you, you forecast it ahead, obviously. So you, you do, you do the best you can on, on pre-launch forecasting and, uh, yeah. And it's, you know, tricky in the semiconductor business too. You can't say, you know, place an order and it doesn't come out, you know, tomorrow. Right. right? It's Wait for roughly it. speaking, it's, it's almost six months from the time you place an order until you can ship a product. Right. Cause you know, wafer manufacturing takes a long time. Then you got to ship it, and if you don't want to air freight it, and then you got to build boards, and then they got to those got to get shipped into a channel. And you know, it's um, from the time we place an order until it gets on the shelf is you know almost half a year. So it's um, you know we and we and we place big bets. These aren't like you know oh we 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 have a few million dollars in inventory. Oh no, it's these are big big bets. Um, yeah. And you yeah. know we expected Ampere to do well, but maybe we underestimated how well it would do. You know. Gotcha. And I think there's other factors too, right? You know, we're all, we're all still at home, <laughs> mm. right? At least many of us are still at home. And I think that's driving so, some kind of, you know, excess, you know, demand for, you know, people are upgrading their machines at home and stuff like that. And I think when, you know, we, we try to factor some of that in, but maybe, maybe we underestimated that too. But, you know, I've, w trust me, we're sensitive to it. We, we wish it wasn't the case. We're building it as fast as we can. We hope everyone who wants an Amber can get it as soon as, you know, as they can and, we're doing everything we can to make that so. Yeah. So we, we nice. have a um, a couple of questions that are coming in, just asking about pre-orders. I know there's people willing to wait; they just want to make sure they get an order in. Any any plans to allow for pre-orders? Is that something you can comment on? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't officially comment. We've heard we've heard those requests. You know, there's and you know, it, I, I, per, per my personal setting, Nvidia aside, I wish there was a way that that we had to kind of get in a queue, so to speak, kind of get in line. Um, and I, you know, and I've, there's all sorts of good ideas there and, you know, we're, um, we're going to take them to heart and I'm sure we'll, you know, we'll make improvements going forward. Got it. Great. Cool. Cool. Well, Tony, uh, we really appreciate, uh, you joining us today. Um, wanted to ask one little question, a uh, little bit, you know, more out of the box, I guess, than all these technical questions and some tough supply questions, um, before we let you go though. And, 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 uh, it, it just occurred to me you work at a at a at a company that's just going gangbusters right now, really making some uh, some amazing products and you know doing some amazing things even in the stock market, really doing well. Um, what's the most inspiring thing for you working at Nvidia all this time? What are you know what are some of the challenges? What are some of the uh, the best things about working at a company like Nvidia, the Silicon Valley juggernaut that it is? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, it, it's so it's, it's funny before. Before I came to NVIDIA, I was at, you know, Apple and Silicon Graphics and 3DFX. And as in fairly common in Silicon Valley, I could never imagine being at a company for five years, let alone 10, let alone 22. <laughs> so clearly NVIDIA is doing something right. Um, and at least for me, th there's a couple things. The first is the people. NVIDIA is filled with passionate, brilliant, hardworking people. Um, and the second is the work. We're doing super interesting, innovative work. And the industry moves quickly. Nvidia moves super quickly. We've we pivot to new technologies quickly. There's always something to learn, and there's always these these great people to work with and learn from, and and you know work next to. And that's that's just super gratifying, right? When when your your hobby is your job, like I, I I'm a technology geek. I'm a graphics geek, and when I get to do that as my job and work with a bunch of great people in an industry that moves super fast on technology that is just amazing, I. 
you know, how can you complain? <laughs> yeah, you can't complain. Not at all. That's a, that's a good gig. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What else, Marco? And then we'll let poor Tony off the hook here. We appreciate your time, Tony. Are we, do we clean up anything in the chat? We I think we cleaned up. We cleaned up most of it. Lots of the, lots of the questions are still revolving around stock. There's only so much we can say, you know, there's only so much to say. Eh? They sold out. They're coming, you know, I wish we can give more detail, but it, it is what it is, folks. Um, so yeah, no, I think, I think we're basically, the, the chat's going by so fast. I'm sure I missed something. <laughs> if, if if there's if there's anything like really burning or technical that we missed, please comment after the video is live, and you know we'll go back to, to Tony and go back to Nvidia and see if we can get stuff answered. If we can't answer it ourselves, obviously, um, I'm scrolling up through here now to see. Um, yeah, what on we've the supply missed, side, but. I mean the initial stock did sell out, but there, there's more stuff shipping, you know, literally every day. So when when it shows up on the shelf, hard to say, but it's stuff is going out constantly. And I think, you know, I've seen some adding card folks say that, you know, the some of our partners are restocking every few days right now. Um, and some of them are using, you know, air freight to ship because they realize that demand's incredibly high. So, I, you know, it, it's not like it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be months. Before You're gonna catch up. Yeah. Right there. We'll, we'll catch up. It, it's probably it'll it'll never be as fast as as people want. I realize that, but you know, <laughs> like I said, we're, we're shipping every day, and hopefully, hopefully they'll show up in a, in the retailer that is near you, and you can get what you need soon. Just cracks me up when they're waiting for you in the chat with Pitchfork saying, "I want my want my ampere. I want my 3080." <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm I'm not the supply guy, but I can totally sympathize. <laughs> You know, if it All makes right. you feel better, you know, I, I tried to get in the queue for a PS5 and an Xbox uh, Series X, you know, for my kids. Couldn't get one of those either. <laughs> I, there feel you go. You. I feel you. <laughs> cool. Well, hey, Tony, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure talking with you. It's great catching up with you. It's been a while since a while. Uh, we've, we've talked with you in, in person and it may be a while before we get to see you in person again. But at least here virtually on the interwebs. Great to see you again, bud. Yeah, you too, guys. Great to see you. Happy to do it. Thanks, and there, Yeah, and there you have it. Tony Tomasi, VP of Technical Marketing at NVIDIA. Good to have you with us, pal. Uh, stop by Hot Hardware where you can find us on the web, twitter.com slash hot hardware, youtube.com slash hot hardware vids. Thumbs up, subscribe, hit that reminder bell, and we'll have more great folks like Tony on in the future, I'm sure. Thanks again, Tony. Good to see you, bud. Thank you. <laughs> Take care and have a good day, everybody. Thanks for stopping by.